show Mike check, get him to go home for more instead of get uh, past him. Funny thing is, that happens every week. YouTube channel we have set up uh, so if you ever want to go back and re-watch some of them they'll be available for you there as well uh, one other thing I want to bring to your attention is that the next week or so we're working on a survey to send out in regards to regathering over over in the sanctuary so what we're looking for is input by you as to when you may feel the most comfortable what kind of things you may want to see in place what kind of advice or comments you have as we think about uh, regathering over in the, in the sanctuary our target is sometime mid-july uh, of course that could change but we're always seeking input to try and make worship the best that it can possibly be so pay attention to the emails uh, probably this week i'll send one out uh, if you are not receiving our emails and you want to uh, make sure you let me know and we can add you to our email distribution list well, having said all that, let's get our hearts and minds ready for worship. And to do that, I want to invite you to join me as we go to the Lord in prayer together. Let us pray. Long before the change of name, before the first signs of new life showed the beginnings of promises fulfilled, Father, you asked Abram to make his home among foreigners and share the blessing that was to come. And now, O oh God, you ask the same faith of us, the faith to count ourselves among the least, to find our place alongside the poor and broken, the faith to trust in your mercy and your promises, and to share what we have received. 
the faith to wait expectantly for your reign of justice and equity together with those who most need his gifts. Teach us to be children of Abram, sharers of the blessings we enjoy. The blessing of plenty shared with those who, ne who have need. The blessing of healing shared with those who are sick and wounded. The blessing of joy shared with those who celebrate and of tears shared with those who grieve. The blessing of friendship shared with those who are excluded and of solidarity with those who fight injustice. The blessing of peace shared with those in conflict and of confrontation shared with those who bring harm. And in some small way, may our faith and our sharing help to bring your promises into being in our world. In Jesus' name, amen.
stay together our call to worship. Our call to worship is posted every week on our Facebook page. It's also emailed out and then handed out by the ushers as you drive in or pull in. Uh, so do make sure that you get a copy that's most convenient to you. But here now our call to worship for this June 14th, 2020 service. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Bring your silence and your shouting as introverts and extroverts. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Bring your songs and your stories, your struggles and your sacrifices. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. He designed and created us. He understands us and is intensely interested in us. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Bring your gifts and your personalities, your strengths and your weaknesses. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. He is just and wise, honest and true, caring and compassionate, eternal and holy. He is God. So we come now to our first reading of Scripture for this morning. And we await with joyous anticipation what the Lord would have be revealed to us through His written word. I invite you to join me as we say together our prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Rome. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. Again, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. The Apostle Paul writes these words. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our suffering. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. My friends, this is the Word of God for you and I, the children of God. Thanks be to God. Sisters and brothers, one of the great truths that we should hold fast and hold dear to is that God's mercy is deeper than the depths of the sea, that God's grace is wider than the whole earth. Trusting in that mercy and in that grace, let us now make our confession before God and each other, first in silent prayer. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought word and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone 
We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear these words. May all God, Almighty God have mercy on you. Forgive all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in life eternal. Amen. Our Apostles' Creed has been part of the church from almost the very beginning, in some way, shape, or form. It is a statement of belief that contains the important facets of what we as Christians should hold as truth. So I want to invite you now as we say together in one voice our statement of faith, our confession of faith, our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. For thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew. This is the ninth chapter, verses 35 through 38. Again, this is Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. It says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Friends, again, this is the word of God for you and I, the children of God. Thanks be to God. You know, we celebrated the graduates last Sunday, and it got me to thinking about my own graduation, then it got to me thinking about my time in college. And I was reflecting upon the fact that when I was in college, like many, I came home during the summertime. And I came home during the summertime and got a job to make a little money for myself. There were two jobs that I had that kind of stand out to me. The first one was after my freshman year in college. I got a job with the minor league baseball team there in my hometown of Winston-Salem. They've had a minor league team there for who knows how long. And when an opportunity arose to work for them, I took it. Now, don't get too excited because the job wasn't exactly what you would refer to as glamorous work. Roughly what happened is that each day after a home game, I would arrive at the stadium at 6 a.m. And I was part of the crew that cleaned that stadium from top to bottom to get it ready for a game that night. Now, I say crew, but in reality, it was just me and a buddy of mine from high school, the two of us that were responsible for cleaning the stadium. We would arrive early in the morning. We'd go first and collect all the cups and all the cardboard boxes, all the cardboard trays, all the big things that, for some reason or another, didn't make its way into the trash cans throughout the stadium. And then we'd go into the bathrooms, and we'd scrub toilets, and we'd clean sinks, and we'd mop the floors. And then we'd, each of us, strap on a gas-powered blower, and we would blow all the 
cigarette butts and popcorn kernels and peanut shells from the concourse level all the way down to ground level. Then we blow them into a pile, we put them in trash bags. Then we clean the dugouts on both, both the home and visitor side. And finally we take all these trash bags and we put them in a big giant industrial dumpster. We start at six in the morning, usually we were done by noon or so. Except for those occasions where it was a day after a Thursday, Thursday night promotion where beer and drinks were half off, then we had more cups to clean up. So we'd be, we'd be there at two or three in the afternoon. And then there was the fateful day when we had to clean the stadium after the 4th of July fireworks display, which has seen the whole city of Winston-Salem must have come because it took us a good 12 or 14 hours to clean the stadium that day. But I remember at, at each and every day when we were finished, my buddy and I would lament to us, if only we had more help, particularly on those hot and humid July and August days. Another job I had summer after my sophomore year was working in a warehouse. Part of our job there was to load 53 foot trailers with cardboard boxes full of matchbooks that we got off of wooden pallets. What happened is one of the guys would drive a forklift into the trailer, we'd take the boxes off one by one and stack them in the back of the trailer. You'd get about 26 pallets worth on a trailer. There were roughly 80 boxes per pallet, which meant that we would put 2,080 boxes in a trailer each time. And we would load five or six trailers a day, which means you're looking at 10,400 to 12,480 boxes that we moved by hand from pallet into the trailer. Thankfully, we had more than just two college boys to do that work. We had a crew of five or six. But there were still, even then, those days where we would look around and say, man, I sure do wish we had some more help. I tell these two stories to say this. Many of you have had jobs that had a large goal or a large task or a project to accomplish. Maybe you had such a project when you were in school, or maybe you had such a project as part of a military unit. But the success of that task relied upon many hands or many minds all coming together in order to be successful. Because alone, we can only do so much. We needed more help at the ballpark. We could have used more help at the warehouse. Now, I mentioned last week, I think, that the vision statement of the United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's kind of an audacious task, is it not? To transform the entire planet? How can we possibly be successful? I mean, that is so much harder than cleaning a baseball stadium or loading a trailer or anything that, that we have had to do in our lives. But thankfully, we're not called to do it alone. But we are called, each one of us, to do our part. Take note in our gospel lesson this morning from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus looks out and what he sees are crowds of people. Unnamed, unknown crowds of people. And he had compassion for them. He saw that they had been harassed and were as helpless as sheep without a shepherd. Hard not to make the same parallel with our world today. Friends, all we have to do is to look around our community, look around our schools, look around our places of business, see what we watch on the television news or see on the internet, and we see crowds of people who need help. We see crowds of people harassed by the enemy walking around carrying burdens upon their shoulders, wandering around without any direction, any love, any support, any hope at all. Harassed by demons of past mistakes, haunted by current decisions, terrified of an unsure future. Maybe you are part of this crowd. We see this and we have compassion and we weep and we may feel despondent and friends, that's okay. But what the Lord Jesus is telling us this morning is that we need to get to work. He looks at the crowds in our story this morning. 
He points them out to the disciples and he says, they need you. I need you. I need you to be willing to be an extension of the work that I have started. I need you to be my feet and my hands, my eyes, my ears, my mouth. These crowds need you to be willing to follow in my footsteps and to proclaim to them the gospel message to repent and believe the good news. I need laborers, not spectators. I need folks willing to, as Butch would say, stand on the promises and not content to sit on the premises. I need you. And friends, Jesus is telling us the same thing this morning. He needs us. He needs every one of us. Because a task as big as transforming the whole world is large, but it is not impossible. You know how you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. That is to say, if you have a large task in front of you, you don't let the size of it intimidate you. You instead take it one step at a time. The first step for us is to get our bearings, to gather our thoughts about us. On Pentecost Sunday, we talked about our need to reflect on the depth of the Holy Spirit before we celebrate its breath. Meaning that we need to open our hearts, our minds, and our souls to the flowing in of the Holy Spirit to expose those areas of our lives that need to be strengthened or need to be straightened and repent of those things that are preventing us from having a relationship with Jesus. Those things preventing us from making Jesus Lord of all aspects of our lives. And then we use that overflow to strengthen us and to go out in the community. But we have to feel it in here first. The second step is to acknowledge the task in front of us. Last week, we talked about the admittedly imperfect nature of our church, of our community, of our country, and about how the way we can make it a little more perfect was to listen to Jesus' call to go and make disciples by teaching and preaching and baptizing and loving and listening and living in peace with one another. Regardless of our skills and our talents and our abilities, we all have one task as people of Christ. And that is to make other disciples. And today, we read about another call to service. Now understand, this is not part of some sermon series I put together. This is not some manufactured plan on my part. But this theme over the last three weeks has been inspired and led, I truly believe, by the Holy Spirit. Because God has something to say to us. So after getting our bearings and understanding our task, today we get to the third step. The how. How do we join together, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to go out and make disciples? How do we gather the harvest that Jesus is speaking of this morning? Well, I think the answer is actually found in another story in the Gospels where Jesus speaks of a harvest. Those of us that have been with us through our Gospel of John Bible study each night may remember the week-long discussion we had about Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. And I'll be honest, since that week, It's been a story that I have reflected upon time and time again because I think that story contains our instructions to be the very laborers that Jesus is calling us to be this morning. For those maybe unfamiliar with the story, it's in John chapter 4. Jesus and the disciples have left Judea and they're heading to Galilee. Now the shortest route to get from point A to point B is to go directly through Samaria. But Jews, particularly God-fearing Jews, avoided that land at all costs because they saw the Samaritans as the very bottom of society, the worst of the worst. Folks you shouldn't even look at, much less hang around with. So when they came upon the border of Samaria, typically they would simply go around. Jesus, though, was determined not only to travel through Samaria 
and to be among the Samaritans, but he had a particular Samaritan in mind. The disciples go off to find food, and Jesus, in the middle of the day, heads to a well on the outskirts of town. And at this well, he finds a woman, a marginalized woman, an outcast from society, which explains why she was there during the middle and the heat of the day, because most folks got their water in the cool of the morning. But she didn't want to be seen by anybody, so she came at noontime. But as you read through this story, what you see is that this woman and Jesus have a deep theological conversation. And the result of that is that the woman becomes to recognize Jesus for who he is. First she sees him as a Jewish man, then she sees him as a prophet, and then she sees him as the Messiah. She recognizes not only Jesus' identity, but also Jesus' mission to save the world. And what does she do? She leaves her water jar there at the well, one of the very few possessions that she has. And she runs back to town to tell them about Jesus. Now understand, she was not an educated woman. She did not understand or know every single word of Scripture. She did not have great wealth. She had no power or status within the community. She was no saint. But she had faith in Jesus. And she told everyone she could about Jesus who he was to her, and what he had done for her. She became a laborer for Christ by simply talking about him. And what happened? We're told in John chapter 4, verse 39, many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. The testimony of one woman brought untold numbers into the family of Christ. Not because she wowed them with her knowledge of Scripture or with signs and miracles or because she was an esteemed member of the community. She served our Lord by simply telling her story. She was faithful by telling of her faithfulness. And that's what we should be doing. Yes, some of us are called to teach and some of us are called to preach and some of us are called to healing ministries and some are called to volunteer out in the community. But all of us have a story to tell about Lord Jesus. All of us have a story to tell about what Jesus means to us and what Jesus has done for us and continues to do for us. And that is how we transform the world. What would it look like at our dinner tables when we gather with family and friends and we talked about Jesus? When we're out in restaurants, what if at our break rooms at work, instead of talking about sports or politics, we talked about Jesus? What if on Facebook, instead of posting articles about COVID conspiracies and the like, we simply talked about Jesus? What if when we were asked the question, hey, what did you do this weekend? That our first response was about worship. Friends, I urge you this morning to think about these steps. To think about what our Lord asks us to do. Understand that this work we need to undertake is not the root of our salvation. It is the fruit of our salvation. Open yourself up to the inflowing and power of the Holy Spirit. Hear the call on your life to be a laborer and to go make disciples for Christ. Leave everything behind that prevents you from giving your whole life to Jesus. And tell everyone that you meet, come, come and see about a man who has given me abundant life. Come and see and hear about the Messiah. Come and be a disciple. Because friends, if we do that, we will transform this world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our prayer this morning is a responsive prayer. You'll hear me say, Lord, in your mercy. And you'll respond by saying, hear our prayer. So again, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy. And you'll say, hear our prayer.
Heavenly Father, we are astonished by your kindness and grace. You call us your treasured people. You send your Son to forgive and redeem us even while we are ungodly and estranged from you. Even more, Jesus calls us to share your gracious love with other ungodly sinners whom you long to make beloved, treasured members of your family. Thank you. Help us to do, say, and be all you envision and will for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your dear Son called and sent the apostles to proclaim the good news, forgive sins, and heal those sorely wounded by the powers of sin, evil, and death. Strengthen and equip your church to follow in their footsteps and to lead the ungodly to the one who died that they might live. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We plead on behalf of our persecuted sisters and brothers. Help us to speak in their defense. Aid them by prayers and material support and to, for them to live lives worthy of our mutual calling in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Make this congregation lovely with holiness, faithfulness, generosity, and joy. Fill us with your spirit so that we serve you with gladness and thanksgiving. Let our lives show the love of Jesus to those who need him the most. in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for families stressed to the breaking point, business owners facing foreclosure or bankruptcy, farmers, fishers, ranchers, and truckers, caregivers to special needs persons, and especially for those who we name before you now, either aloud with our lips or silently in our hearts. this we ask, dear Father, in the power of your Spirit. Receive our prayers and grant all that is in accordance with your will for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, as we pray those familiar words he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. As we come now to our time of collection of God's tithes and our offerings, our ushers will be coming forward with our offering buckets. We just simply ask that you unroll your window and drop your offering or gift into the bucket when they approach.
Amen. 